we have a very special treat. Um, our beloved Pastor John Welsh is going to be bringing the word to you today. <laughs> Amen. Now, in case maybe if you're new around here, uh, Pastor John has uh, faithfully ministered on staff uh, at New Life for 17 years, I believe, wasn't it? 17 years. Um, but as uh, he he retired to about four and a half years ago, and, but is, has been always his way. Um, him and Dottie have continued to minister behind the scenes to so many of you. And um, he's been a source of encouragement and shepherding and wise counsel to our staff and to me as well. Um, he is a man that, and he told me not to, not to just lift him up too much, but I just want to say this, like, he is a man that leaves a lasting imprint on you whenever you encounter him. And so I have no doubt that that's going to happen today as he brings the word of God to you and exalts Jesus far above himself. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that. Um, as we invite him up, could you just you maybe just stand and just give him a new life welcome? Hold on to this for now. Just give me a heads up. Well, what happened to spring? I mean, I th you know, I, when, I, when I first came up here to Maine, I heard a number of phrases that took me about 10 to 15 years to figure out. You know, you can't get there from here or here. Uh, if you don't like the weather, wait a while. And uh, that there was five seasons in Maine, and mud season was the other season. And uh, I think there's another one, it's called the tease. And I think we just had that last week. Am I, am I maybe going here? No, okay. So uh, it's quite a tease. And uh, I just want you to know something. I have the authority to say this, having been uh, born in Philadelphia and raised in Philly and right outside the suburbs, Puxatawney Phil is wrong. <laughs> Amen. He has no right to say that there is uh, do I turn this off or just move it over somewhere? Okay. Thanks, Trevor. He has no right to prophesy what he did, and I'm sure if he lived in Aroostook County, he would be speaking forth other things than what he's saying. Amen? So pay no attention to him. Trust me on that one. Amen. Would you stand this morning? Thank you, Pastor Justin, for the opportunity to speak today and share God's heart, what I believe God's put on his heart. Thank you for trusting in me, believing in me over the years, and giving me this opportunity. I appreciate it. So I want us to uh, read a passage of Scripture today. It's a very short passage of Scripture. It's in Matthew chapter 11. It's in the Passion Translation. It says, From the moment John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth, and passionate people have taken hold of it in its power. Father, today is your church. We pray for the nations. We pray specifically for Ukraine, Poland, Belarus, Russia, and those nations in that Baltic area. We ask for your divine intervention, Lord. You are the one who sets up a king and puts down other kings. You are the one, Lord, that you said unto you shall the gathering of the people be. You are the one that is given all the nations as an inheritance. And we pray, Father, that your will would be done in that area of the earth in this time, Father, that the will of men would not be accomplished, but those who stand for righteousness and peace and freedom, Father, that they would have first place. We lift up Ukraine to you. We lift up the nations. We lift up Canada to you, Lord, in all that they are standing for for their freedom. And all across the earth, people standing for the freedom. You said that you have come, that we might have life and have it abundantly. You said it is for freedom's sake that we have been set free. We call out to you today, Father, especially for these nations, for our children, and for their future. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm a little nervous. It's been about five years since I've preached here. Um, after I retired my position, retired my jersey here at New Life, I preached for about a year and a half at a church up north, and it uh, was a good opportunity. So uh, I might be a little rusty today, so, so bear with me. I'm going to try and move along, but not rush, because I know that there's another service, and I have no clue how long I'm going to take. But I do know there's some things on my heart, and I really want to really get them out. So <laughs> please bear with me. Amen. Okay, so just a few opening statements to give you a little heads up of uh, where I'm coming from. We are in desperate need of Almighty God's intervention in the earth. Thank you. Wars and rumors of wars, worldwide pandemic repercussions, famines, increased persecutions, and the list goes on, along with our own life challenges. But the good news is that God is still in love with people on the earth. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. And Jesus is that way. He is that truth. And he is that life. There's also good news that he's heard our prayers, petitions, and intercessions, and has invited us into his plans and purposes in the days that we're living in today. He intends revival for us. A bride, I'll say that again. I should have got a few more amens. He intends revival for us. I really believe that revival is our survival. You know, 20-some you know, years ago, God put it on my heart to be praying for revival in the state of Maine and in New England and in the region. And uh, I just thought it was, you know, was kind of like praying for a nice thing to happen, something good, you know. And I, just, and I prayed, you know, like, you know, this would be really nice. Well, something has shifted over the years, and I truly believe that praying for revival is our survival. And Jesus is in love with the United States of America and he wants to use his church to touch this nation. Yes. Amen. I believe that when the righteous rule, as the scripture says, it goes well for the people, and a nation is blessed to be a blessing because the living God is their Lord. Yes. Amen. Can you say amen? Yes. Are you with me this morning? Yes. I just want you to know you can shout, you can do whatever you want to do. It's okay. All right? Yes. Amen. You need to be excited. God's doing something here at New Life Church. You know? I, I'm a first service person. I usually sit in the back. I, I like to watch people. It used to be part of my job to watch people. And, uh, you know, so uh, being up here is a little bit of a different view. Next week I'll, I'll be back there probably. So uh, really appreciate this. All right, so what is God getting ready to do? I believe that the delivering, saving will of God is being done and will be done on earth in these days as it is in heaven. In the church in America, and in the nations, and that nothing can stop what is coming. Nothing can stop the word of God from being fulfilled. God does win because his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. I believe the knowledge of his glory, as it says in Habakkuk, will fill the nations of the earth as the waters fill the seas, one of my favorite passages of scriptures, that the glory of the Lord will fill the earth, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, which means the glory of the Lord would need to be here, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters fill the seas. He said, and I desire for my house to be a house of prayer for all nations. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I am convinced that there is coming an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is what God's getting ready to do, by the way. I believe and I'm convinced that there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit increasing in us and through us and that will manifest in a love for God and a love for people that will not only revive the church but will enable us to receive and respond correctly to the great harvest of souls for men, women, and children that God is preparing to gather for himself. I wrote these things down because I wanted to get it right. I wanted to say it right. I didn't want us to miss what God is doing in this hour. And I want to say that again. I am convinced that there is coming an outpouring of the Holy Spirit increasing in us and through us, manifesting in a love for God and a love for people that will not only revive the church, but enable us to receive and respond correctly to the great harvest of souls of men, women, and children that God is preparing to gather for himself. Amen. Amen. I do. I truly do. 
You know, I was thinking about New Life the other day, think about New Life a lot and pray, pray for the staff and pray for you all. And I was thinking, you know, Lord, I'm told that there's a, a pretty good amount of growth in the second service. And I thought, well, you know, we always thought about this when we were in staff. Do we go to one service? Do we stay at two services? I think you better just stay. This is just my opinion. You better just stay at two services because if you go to one service, when all, this harvest comes in, you're going to have to go to two services anyhow. Amen. I don't believe that God's primary, primary agenda for this church is church growth. I believe that his primary, his primary agenda for this church is revival. And I am extremely confident, I purposely use these adjectives, I am extremely confident, persuaded, that God does not want us to wait for an anointing or feelings to love him by obeying his commands to be living and loving for him. Today is the acceptable day. Today, he says, if you hear my voice, don't harden your hearts. Enter into that, tr that rest, that rest of faith. Today is the acceptable day. For too long, we've been waiting for something to happen. You know, we sing that song. I love that song when we do that song. You know, we need a move. We need a move. And I really think that the move that we need is the move in, in us. You know, I, I, I know that there's a place where God is waiting on us and we're waiting on God and we think it's usually that we're waiting on God, but I'm pretty sure that it's usually God is waiting on us and we're telling him to move and he's wanting us to move. He's wanting us to rise up. He's wanting us, the scripture says in the book of Isaiah, is there anyone who stirs himself up to take hold of me? You see, it's our responsibility for revival. Yeah. Let me say that one more time, maybe two. It is our responsibility for revival. It is our responsibility for revival. God is wanting us to stir ourselves up. He's wanting us to call out to him. He's wanting us to work in us. You know, if you pray something, you better be prepared for God to work in you because how can you ask God to do something in somebody else that you're not willing for him to do in you first? Come on, those of you who pray. I think that's the reason why a lot of people don't pray, because if they pray, they have a sense of inward witness that, that, you know, I have a responsibility, and I can't just say this because otherwise I'm going to be a hypocrite. And that's okay. That's just, that's just a working of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and me to get us rightly aligned when we do pray. Amen? Amen. So that we're praying for God's will to be done, and we want it to be done in our life. So we can stir ourselves up to take hold of God. He's been at work in us to will and to work for a good pleasure. He says that verse, you know, I'm sure you've heard of it, God is at work in our lives to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Another translation says God has been working in our lives to not only give us the desire to do his will, but to give us the ability to fulfill his will. I, I like different translations of, of the Bible. I like good different translations and paraphrases of the Bible because because it just kind of opens up, opens up the Word of God. I remember when the Amplified Version came out, everybody was just so excited because it just gave a bit more expression, if you will, than to the King James that a lot of people were reading at that time. And now we have the message paraphrase, we have the passage translation, and, the, and it's the Word of God is just brought out in such a great way. And when I realized in that particular translation that God not only puts the will, His will on the inside of us, the desire to do His will, and this is his word. This is what he says he's doing. This is what he's been doing. This is what he's going to continue to, to do. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. His word will not return unto him void. Amen. It's like the rain and the snow that come down. They don't return unto him void until they watered the earth, until they've accomplished what he pleases. Is this not the way my word will be that comes out of my mouth? And he's brought forth his word, and he says, I am working in you. I've been working in you. And I'm prefacing something that I want to say today with these words, so I want you to grab hold of this. I'm setting you up from some, for, the, for the truth of what it is that God has been doing, that he has been doing something in your life. You know, I like that, that song that came out in, uh, right in the middle of the COVID, COVID pandemic, that song. It's called, uh, uh, we know, well, the, the one that we know, it's called the... Uh, What's the one? Waymaker, promise keeper, uh, waymaker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. What's the other one? You don't want me singing. Come on, t tell me, tell, tell me, waymaker, miracle worker, 
promise keeper, light in the darkness. And that song came out. I remember I was here the Sunday that Pastor Jeff had that video played. I, I don't, I'm, I'm shocked that Pastor Jeff did that in all the years that I was on staff that he actually put a YouTube video up during, during service. But he did, and I'm glad that he did. And that was such a powerful song. I believe that that was the Holy Spirit speaking to us as the church. You know, we, 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 we think that the Holy Spirit's going to speak to us through, a, through, a, through a, a preaching message, and he does. We think that the Holy Spirit's going to speak to us through his word in different ways, and he does. But he speaks to us through song. He speaks to us through music. He speaks to us, and, he's, and he tries to get his message across to us. And I believe that he was, he was saying to us what he said, what the lyrics that were in that song, that he's always been working, that he never stops working. Amen? That, and then, there, then shortly thereafter, if I'm not mistaken, out came this song, if you will. If I may not be getting the, the name. It might have been a song. It might have just been some kind of, uh, I don't know. But it came out, and it was, and it was called The Blessing. And it, it was interesting about the song that was The Blessing because it was based on Rome, uh, Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. And it was also, I think, a little bit of a, I think it was influenced by that song about the Waymaker. And it was called The Blessing. And, we, and I think it was first sung, I was at my, my uh, who were the people who sung it first? Carrie Job. Carrie Job. Thank you. Carrie Job with, who was the guy? Cody Clark. Co Cody Clark. Cody Carnes. Cody Carnes. Cody, that's her husband. Oh, okay. Didn't know that. All right, they sang that song. The next thing you know, it was being sung in another country in another language, and another country in another language, and another country in another language, and another country. And I believe that was the Holy Spirit setting up His church worldwide to, to speak blessing over one another from one nation to the other, that God, in the midst of all that was going on, was speaking blessing over His church and telling us that He was with us, that He was for us, that He was behind us, that He was beside us, that He was in us, and he was, in, he was with us and with our children and with our children's children. He was messaging us. I want you to see that if you didn't see that because I want you to get a hold of it that he's been working and he's still working. He's doing something. I know he's been at work. I know he's been giving us his ability. And I want you as God's people to personally encounter the power of God in this land and region. Let me tell you a short story if I can. 27 years ago, I was pastoring in Scarborough. I was pastoring a church in Scarborough, and I was walking through the living room. I have four children, two boys, two girls. My girls are twins. They're, they're, they're uh, all married except my daughter right now who's in China. I have 10 grandchildren. And then I had the four children. I'm walking through my house in Scarborough, and Star Trek's on. I hope I didn't lose too many of you by telling you that. The so Star Trek was, was, was on, and I walked through the living, living room, and I am just, it's a long living room. That's about the only longest room we had in the house. Uh, yeah. And I just walked through there, and there's these, there's two cadets. They're on, they're watching the Star, the kids are watching this, the Star Trek episode, and there's these two cadets, and they're, they're moving on these, like, screens, and they're pushing these buttons, and they're turning these knobs, and they're doing these, these different things because this was somehow they had to achieve a particular goal, and whoever did would become would go from being a cadet to go into being in the space space force. And they're moving these knobs and pushing these buttons and pushing these buttons. And there's all these shapes that are moving around on this big screen, and they're multicolored shapes, and they're different size shapes, and they're just moving around and moving around and moving around. Somehow, by them pushing those buttons put, and and turning those knobs, somehow they were affecting what was going on in the screen, and that's what they were supposed to do, so that that those multitude of pieces and shapes could come together into a particular particular shape. And I just happened to be walking through, and I heard, and the Lord said to me, that's what I'm doing in my church. And I went, that's what you're doing in your church. <laughs> what, 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 what are you doing in your church? That's what I'm doing in my church. I knew it was the Lord because it just came out of nowhere, and it t totally boggled me. I, boggled me as only God can boggle me. And it bothered me. He says, this is what I'm doing in my church. And I was like, what do you do? What, what, what do you mean? He said, I don't put a puzzle together the way that men put puzzles together. Men put puzzles together one piece at a time. They look for similar colors. They start in the corner. And, that's how, and they, re, they rely on a visual that they can already see to put the puzzle together. But I don't put a puzzle together the way that men put puzzles together. 
I am working in the individual puzzle pieces. Now, that you, got, you get this. You're the individual puzzle pieces in this. I am working in my individual puzzle pieces, and, and when I am ready, I am going to put the whole puzzle together at one time. 27 years ago, I'm going to put the whole puzzle together at one time, and I'm going to do this for two reasons. Am I... Okay, what do you want me to... If I take off my jacket, does it help? No, you're good. Ryan will need that. Now? I get, okay. All right, I can just use that by faith. All right, I'm, I'm talking. Is it on? Okay, I can't hear it as well. There you go. It's okay. Appreciate it, Ryan. It's okay. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. <laughs> You know, the Bible says that in the last days, people will be going to and fro at great speed and, and communication, tech, communication will increase. That's what's happening today, but we're still working on it. It's not quite interesting. It's not quite interesting. Wow. This one's got a battery in it. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Amen. That does sound better. Anything will help. Amen. So, the puzzle pieces... He said, I will put those puzzles. Whoa, we got effects going too. <laughs> Dear Jesus. Amen. I will put the puzzle, I will put that puzzle together all at once. And I will do that for two reasons. He said, number one, it's going to be a surprise attack of the enemy, just like it was at the time when I was crucified and put on the cross. The enemy didn't realize what was going on. He would have never done, the scripture says he would have never crucified Jesus Christ had they known what was going to come forth by his death, burial, and resurrection. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to bring a surprise attack on the enemy, if I'm trying to get the words as well as I can remember. And he said, the second reason I'm going to do it suddenly and I'm going to do it all at once is because I, I don't want my church to mess it up. <clears throat> That's when I really knew that this was God talking to me because I was like, you're right. If we, when we get the things of God, if we get them too soon or we hold on to them too long, I mean, there's just more chance, you know, not that we're intentionally doing it, but just more chance for us to, to not get it right because we see in part, we know in part, and so on and so forth. And I was like, okay, thank you, Lord, you know. And I'm thinking, because I'm pastoring at the time, you know, somehow this is going to come to play in what I'm doing in the church and so on and so forth. That was 27 years ago. Three years ago, the Lord spoke to me about that dream. Three years later. So 24 years of silence. Three years later, I'm on my way up north to preach at a friend's church. I'm a little early. I pull off to a truck stop just to relax for a minute or two. And the Lord says, do you remember that, you remember that picture about the puzzle pieces? I'm like, yeah. He said... He says, what I'm doing in those puzzle pieces is I've been creating capacity on the inside of those puzzle pieces. I've been working in those puzzle pieces to create capacity like new wineskins so that I can fill them to the degree that I want, to, I want to fill them. But my people have not understood. They've misunderstood that I've been working in their life. They've been wondering where I am. They've been wondering what's been going on. They've been wondering why things haven't been happening. They've been wondering why, like the dials, they've been doing things and trying to do what they, they could do to try and, and bring about more and more of my will. They've been wondering what's going on and where is God and how, how come does this happen and what is that? They've even confused some things that I've done that the enemy's done. And, and vice versa, but I've been creating capacity on the inside of those people, in, in the inside of my people, and I've been creating capacity to be able to, I'm just going to say this, I am creating capacity to fill them because I want to personally encounter the people of this land and region, and I intend to do so through my people as the power of my love flows through them uniquely in ways that I have purposed. I've been preparing the puzzle pieces, creating capacity for that deposit of his spirit, the deposit of a spirit of power and love to be deposited into my people so that it could manifest in them uniquely as they are unique and according to my purposes because I desire to encounter the people of Maine, New England, and this region. 
And that's pretty powerful. What makes it powerful is if it's true. Not just sharing something that sounds like, wow, that would really be nice if that happened. But Lord, is this really something that you're getting ready to do? And I believe that he is. So he cares about America. Jesus cares about America. Can you say amen? Jesus is in love with America. He doesn't love America any more than any other nation, but he cares about America. This country was founded with our forefathers in covenant with, if you will, with God Almighty. Our nation's governmental system is set up according to the word of God. The executive, the judicial, and the legislative branch comes right from the word of God. God has a special place in his heart for America, and he desires for America to be revived, and he's looking at his church to be the agent that he chooses to flow through. Can you say amen? God is sovereign and can do anything he wants to do on his own, but he's chosen to bless us and to bring us into this place. So what part does he have for us? He told us to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these other things will be, will be added unto us. Pastor's been speaking about the kingdom of God and I just felt there was a need that for me to, to put this into the message. I kept thinking, does it fit, does it fit? And he's like, just put it in there. And I, so, so here it is. There is a reason why we are supposed to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what comes to me that I think that the Lord is trying to say to his people is, if you get preoccupied trying to get everything in order in your life and getting things where you need them to be or want them to be or think they need to be or you, you desire for them to be and then you're going to seek the kingdom of God, you chances are you probably won't get to that part of seeking the kingdom of God the way that you need to seek the kingdom of God. And God knows that. And he tells us to seek first the kingdom of God because he knows that that's the most important thing for us to seek. And it's the most important thing for us to seek first. And he also knows that if we will do what he tells us to do the way that he tells us to do it, in the order that he tells us to, we'll be, we'll be blessed, which means to be in a more fortunate position. So he wants us to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Amen. Its establishment. I've appreciated the series that pastor has been preaching. So what part does he have for us? Let me just share this with you. This is from Voice of the Martyrs. It's a quote. Approximately three billion people live in countries where Christians face some form of communist oppression. They endure threats, intimidation, restrictive laws, economic hardship, and imprisonment by communist authorities and groups. Despite the risks, they continue to boldly proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Are we positioned for participation in what God is getting ready to do? Because in the non-persecuted church, which is us, that flow of the power and the love of the Holy Spirit has been choked out by the deceiver, the father of lies, the murderer, the accuser of the brethren. The demonic lullaby, the subtle satanic strategy has been brought upon us just like Israel experienced over and over and over again. In the time of Judges, it's a time period of approximately 365 years. At least eight different times Israel was in a position where they needed God to come in and raise up another leader. And the leaders in those times were called judges, like Samuel and Samson and Othniel and, and, and uh, Ehud and others were, that, were, the, were, the leaders, were the leaders that were there. At least eight different times in that passage of about 365 years, God had to come in and God had to raise up a leader because what happened to that nation was that that nation that was enjoying the blessing of God, enjoying, enjoying what God had done in their life, began to slip away from enjoying the, the from they, they began to focus more on enjoying the blessing of God than enjoy, enjoying the God who brought the blessing upon them. And they began to not need God. They began to not they began to slip away from him. They began to not seek God. They began to focus on themselves instead of others. They began to draw away, and then challenges began to come in their life, and things began to fall apart in the nation. And then the nation started to, to moan and groan and cry out to God for what was going on. And God would hear their prayer, and he would come in, and he would deliver them, and he would, he would bring them freedom, and he would raise up another leader who would lead them and bring them into into the life that God had for them and bless them. And then the, that pattern would, re, would basically repeat itself over and over at least eight different times in the book of Judges. Now let me say something to you here.
before you just go off as a, what I would say is just an understandable American Western church perspective, which is, well, that can't happen to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, the message says it this way. This is Paul speaking to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. These are warning markers, talking about Israel, specifically at the time he was talking about Israel in the wilderness, but it has to do with the way that Israel was. These are warning markers saying in our history books, danger, written down so we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They are at the beginning, Israel. We are not. We are at the end. And we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Let me just read that a little better this time. These are warning markers saying in our history books, danger, written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end, and we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Let me just say this. This is not an indictment to anyone or to our country. It is a reflection of human nature falling prey to a subtle, satanic strategy. Psalm 80, if we put that up on the screen. I believe that Psalm 80 was a plea for Israel, a plea from Israel, a plea to God. And I really believe that it's also to be a plea for America. I'm going to read it here. It says, Strengthen the man that you love. The son of your choice. And this only reads this way in the NLT. Strengthen the man you love. Strengthen the son of your choice. He's talking about a people. Strengthen the son of your choice. Then we will never abandon you again. Revive us so that we can call on your name once more. Turn us again to yourself, O Lord God of heaven's armies. Make your face shine down upon us. Only then will we be saved. God burned this scripture into, into me about a year and a half ago. You know, I think it's in Jeremiah that the scripture says, do you not know that God's word is like a fire and it's like a hammer that beats upon a rock? Think about a hammer that beats upon a rock. You hit the rock, nothing happens. You hit the rock, nothing happens. You keep, you keep hitting and hitting. What happens after a while? You feel like, I don't want to keep hitting this rock because, you know, maybe it's hurting me or something's not happening. But God's word is like a fire and it's like a hammer that beats upon the rock because there will come a blow that will break open that rock and you don't know if that blow isn't the next blow that's going to break open that rock. And that's the way God's word is, just like he says in Isaiah. And a fire, a fire, something went inside of me and was like, this is, this is, I'm trying to tell you, John, this is, this is what America needs. They need to call out to me the same way that Israel did when they needed him, and we see this in Psalm 80, they need to call out to me. They need to, you, they need to, they need to call out to me be, so that we will never abandon him again. We need to call out to him so that he'll revive us so that we can have the right to call upon him once more. We need to call out to him so he can turn us again to himself, the Lord God of heaven's armies, the Lord God of the Elohim, the Lord God it's Adonai Sabaoth, I believe is what it is. Have you noticed in the last year you keep hearing about the Lord God of the angel armies? Have you noticed? I mean, we've got, the, we've got it up here. Pastor Steve was, was the key guy behind putting these names up here. Elohim, Jesus, Savior, Most High, Messiah, Holy One, King of Kings, and some in different languages because it's, this church is a church of the nations as well. And these are names of God, but it just seems to me, and, as, and I don't, I, can I get a witness when I say this, that there's, been, there's been, a, been an increase in hearing about the Lord God of the angel armies. So, okay, I've got one, two, can I see your hands? Okay, there, that's good, because I, I really thought so. And I believe that that's God messaging us again. He, he is all that he says that he is, but in this time, he's trying to say something else. I am Adonai Sabaoth. I am the Lord God of the angel armies. I am the Lord God of heaven's armies. Another translation says, I am, Ado I am the Lord God of the Elohim, of all of the host of heaven in the universe. I am that Lord God. And I believe that he's saying, I'm getting ready to do what I'm going to do, and, and, and it's going to involve my angel armies. But he wants us to call out to him because he says, if you, if you will call out to me and turn again to me, the Lord God of heaven's armies, I will make my face to shine, do, shine down upon you, which is taken from 
Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. He says, and only then will you be saved. He is our only salvation. And I believe the church is the answer and revival in the church is the answer to this country and to this nation and that God desires America to be blessed, to be a blessing. Can you say amen? Amen. So what are a few steps that we can take right now? What are a few steps that we can take right now so that we are positioned? I'm going to go through them pretty fast. Get ready. All right. One of the verses that's embedded in my heart is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If the one being Jesus died for all of us, then all who he died for should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who loved them and gave himself for them. And Revelation chapter 2, where Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus that you have forgotten your first love and they should return to their first love and they should do the first works. We, we need to renounce our self-sufficiency as Americans and remember we were bought with a price. This is what the church and only the church can do. Let's not keep talking about the problems in America and the problems with America's people, but, but, but begin to recognize the light of the, of the gospel that we have received, that we see what is going on and we are awake. The Bible says, you who slumber, wake up because your salvation is nearer than when you first believed. He wants us to wake up. He wants us to wake up first so that he can bring his anointing, his blessing, his outpouring in us and through us, because how can he do that? How can he pour that out through his people to help, to help be prepared for the harvest that he's getting ready to do if they're not prepared? It would not be good, amen? It'd be like having a set of pipes all crooked up, down, left, right, and thinking you're going to send the flow of the mighty Holy Spirit down through those pipes when basically that if the God flowed through it that fast, it would just break everything apart because that we're not aligned. We're not, the way, we're not lined up the way he wants us to be lined up. And the good news is he's made it easy through the cross. He's made it easy for us through the cross for us to be aligned, to be where he, needs, where he wants us to be. We can renounce our self-sufficiency. Remember we were bought with the price. We can seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. We can take Paul's advice to Timothy that no man that wars entangles himself about with the affairs of this life, that he may... He may please him who has called him to be a servant. We can speak his word. We can set our affections on things above, not on things below, because we are dead and our life is hidden with Christ in, in God. We can pray for one another. We can lay hands on the sick regardless of results. We can expect miracles. We can speak his word out loud. We can say what he says. We can do what he says. We can say that God said it, that settles it, and we confess it because we know it's true. We can have a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego mindset. Come on. Are there any Shadrachs out there today? Any Shadrachs? Any Meshachs? Any Abednegoes? Any Ruths? Any Debras? Any Esthers? Where are you? Are you out there? Joshua's, Caleb's, come on, we're the church. We're the church. We're the church. You know that word, church, the church, the word is ecclesia. One of the definitions is those who are called out for a purpose. Not just called out, but called out for a purpose. And not just to be called out to wait, but to occupy the scriptures are there for us. We don't have to figure it out. We've just got to get into his word and invite the Holy Spirit to make his word come alive on the inside of us once again as it did before. Amen. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like asking to be born again again. You just know something has happened. We sang songs today about being revived. Amen. It's our responsibility, and Jesus wants to do it. And I want you to know something. I really feel in my heart, and I struggled a bit with this for a couple reasons, but I really felt the Lord said, I want you to, to bring this message to your home church first because it's a now word for the church. And this is my home church. And it is a now word. And if it's a now word, you won't need to hold on to it just because I said it. You'll see it because it's what God put on my heart and the heart of others. And if it's the Lord, it's bearing witness in the heart of other people. It's not just one person. Can you say amen? And it's not just one local church. It's the rock. It's the point. 
It's Lakeview. It's all these other churches that, that, that bow their knee to Jesus and declare his lordship and seek after him and make room for the Holy Spirit because he will come. And that is part of our move is to make room for him to move. And he will move because he loves his church and his word will not return unto him void. Can you say amen? All right, so basically all those different things that we can do, I could say it this way. We need to embrace Mark 9.23 to 26. Let's just read that. Okay, Luke. Did I say Luke? Mark? I said Mark, it's Luke. Luke, Luke, they were friends. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, from the Passion Translation. Jesus said to all of his followers, if you truly desire to be my disciple, if you truly, today, I said today if you hear his voice, Today, if you hear his voice, Jesus said, if you truly desire to be my disciple, you must disown your life completely, completely. Embrace my cross as your own and surrender to my ways. For if you choose self-sacrifice, giving up your lives for my glory, you will discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourselves, you will lose which you try to keep. Even if you gain all this wealth and power of this world and all things it could offer you, yet lost your soul in the process, what good is that? So why then are you ashamed of being my disciples? Are you ashamed of the revelation truth I give to you? I, the Son of Man, will one day return, and my radiant brightness and with the holy angels and in the splendor and majesty of my Father, and on that day, I will be ashamed of everyone who has been ashamed of me. We don't want that. Amen. We don't need to wait for persecution to rise up as a persecuted church would rise up. Amen. There's a reason why people from Afghanistan and Iran, where the two countries where the gospel, where, where, where people are coming to Christ, coming to Christ, more people are coming to Christ in Afghanistan and, and Iran per capita, this day than any country in the world and there's a reason because they're under great persecution and that persecution brings out the best in the people of god but without that persecution we can tend to go a different way but we don't need to wait for persecution to come to be able to 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 be able to and to choose to live for jesus christ the way he's telling us to in this passage of scripture in luke chapter 9. in fact if we don't begin to more and more live the way that he has asked us to live we won't be prepared for the persecution that will come because the Bible tells us that when you live, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There is coming a great revival. There is coming a great work of God. There is an outpouring of the Spirit of God. He said, I'll pour out my Spirit in the last days upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall dream dreams and your old men shall see visions or vice versa. That is going to happen because God said it, but there's going to be pushback. There's going to be a clash of kingdoms when that time comes and we need to be prepared and God wants us to be prepared. Amen. Can you say amen? All right. All right. So here's where we are. I'd like you to stand with me just for this reading. We have a decision to make as God's people. We have to decide if there is anything that he cannot ask of us. We have to decide if he is worthy. And those are things to meditate on, things to weigh out in your heart, not just today, but each and every day. We have to be willing to determine if we're going to be Luke chapter 9, 23 through 26 people, where we desire to be his disciple, disown our life, embrace his cross as his own, surrender to his ways, and take up our cross and follow him. This is a choice that we have to make. You know, we pray the prayer. I thankfully Jesus so so prepared us, and in the prayer we call the Lord's Prayer, which was the prayer the Lord told us to pray. He says, "Give us this day our daily bread. This day, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come." He told us to call for His kingdom to come, for His will to be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom yours is the glory and yours is the power forever forever and forever amen
So we have a choice today. As we, are we, as God's people, willing to take a step today and pray a prayer of dedication together? Are you willing to do that with me today? All right, I'd like to lead you in this prayer. I want you to say this with me. And if you agree with this in your heart, when we come to the end, I want you to say amen, and I'll prompt you at that time. Because I want it to be something that you, in hearing what it is that we're praying, you mean it and you want it. Because what I believe is it will set in motion a change in your life because of what God is getting ready to do and that it is a now time. So pray with me, if you will. Jesus, I come boldly before your throne because of your work on the cross. I realize there's been a work of the enemy. There's been infiltration and invasion. There's been deception and lying. I am awake to this now. I repent of resisting or grieving your Holy Spirit, knowingly or otherwise. And I verbalize my decision to return to your way and to take up my cross each day. I express out loud from my heart my willingness to pay the price of loving Jesus, specifically by obeying his command to love others as he loved me. Father, I ask for your grace to help me. Help me risk, especially when I'll be persecuted for it. I surrender your life into my arms like a little child. I declare you are Lord of my life, not me. I petition you for a baptism of passion to live for you, to love for you, to be yours, and to do your will. I receive a fresh start today. I receive new mercies. I receive abundant grace. And I thank you for this, Lord. And I believe this, and I say amen. Amen. Bless God. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to get right with God? Isn't it good to return to him? He says, don't you know it is the grace, the love of God that leads us to repentance, that leads us to return. It's a gift for us. Repentance is a privilege. Can you say that with me? Repentance is a privilege. Say it again. Repentance is a privilege. Repentance is a privilege. Amen. Isn't it good to be clean? Isn't it good to be right? Isn't it good to be positioned? If you're positioned, you're where you need to be so that when he does what he's getting ready to do, he knows where to find you. And he knows that you're ready because he's been at work in your life. He's been working. He never stops working. He's there for you. Amen? You need to get excited in the weeks to come. What God's getting ready to do in you and through you and others. Amen? Before you go, I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for everyone who's here today. I pray for their families. I pray blessing upon them and health. I pray that they would have an increased receptivity to your voice. I pray that they would have a keen exposure of the enemy tactics that dreams, promises, prayers, petitions, prophecies, and passion would be revived for them. Father, I pray as you say, call out to me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things, things that have been fenced in and hidden, things you've not seen, recognized, distinguished, or had knowledge of. Reveal them to them, Father God. Let the promises of your word come forth as, as you said in the book of John that you've come that we might have life and have it to the full. Father, let an increase of your Holy Spirit flow out of their innermost being in a way that surprises them, excites them, and gives them expectation, Father, for the work of your Holy Spirit in these days. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. You said, he who believes in me out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Father, 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 we believe. We believe. We know your word is true. Father, Father, release your Holy Spirit in our lives. Surprise us by the work of your Holy Spirit. We bless you, Father. I thank you for my brothers. I thank you for my sisters. 
I thank you for their families. I thank you for their children. I thank you for the body of Christ and our love and our need for one another. Help us to love one another as you loved us and so fulfill your greatest commandment. Because Jesus, we love you above all else. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless all of you. Bless the Lord. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Have a good day in the Lord. Spring is coming.